There are no better words in sports than Game 7. The Edmonton Oilers have a chance to win their first Stanley Cup since George H.W. Bush was president. Let's get to work, Oilers fans. You are Locked On Oilers, your daily podcast on the Edmonton Oilers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Monday, Game 7 of the Stanley Cup Final Edition of Locked On Oilers. I am your host, Nick Zerars. I want to thank everybody making Locked On Oilers your first listen of the day. Locked On Oilers, your team every day. Before we get to today's jam-packed Game 7 episode, got to remind you, today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. Make every moment more as playoffs wind down, the sport stops sporting like we want them to. But this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or a bonus daily. That's right. There's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Visit FanDuel.com slash locked on to get started. So to lay it out for you, this is real simple. First segment, we're going to talk macro, what it all means, the Oilers' journey to get here. And I'm not just talking about this season. I'm talking about the long, winding road to get here. Like we talked about the other day, short, medium, and long-term range causes. We're going to touch on all of that. Second segment, we're going to talk about recent NHL history and Stanley Cup final game number seven. And then the final segment. It's real simple, Matt. It's Game 7. We're going to talk all things Game 7. So, in the aggregate, it is not just this season. It is not just this specific iteration of the Edmonton Oilers. We've talked a lot on this show in the time I've been doing it since the first round series against the Kings. Things don't happen for one reason. In a given playoff series, that's not something that just happens in a vacuum. All of those players, all of those coaches, all of those support staff people, that front office, all of those people have worked a long, winding road to get here. You think about the blood, sweat, and tears each and every single one of those guys has put into their hockey life. We're not just talking about the NHL. We're talking junior or college or in Europe. We are talking about having a different level of determination from being very young. You know, you listen to a lot of these guys talk about when they started to realize they were different than the other kids. Their mindset was different. They were more competitive. We're talking about six or seven years old. You know, a few weeks ago, I shared the anecdote about McDavid asking his parents if they could write Sidney Crosby a letter asking for advice of how to deal with pressure, how to deal with stressful situations. Connor McDavid was five years old. Sidney Crosby was, I want to say, 16 years old when that letter, when he asked to write his parents to write that letter. Connor McDavid realized from a very young age he was different than everybody else. And it's not just him. I know a lot of the conversation, me included, I, I love talking about him. I find him eminently fascinating in relation to some of the other players in the league. And I know McDavid gets a bad rap for not being the most gregarious, the most affable player, the most open forthcoming, but I have such a fundamental level of respect for somebody so determined to be great. And this is something I've thought about a lot over the years. And I'm going to bring this, I wasn't planning on talking about this, but i Bringing up McDavid's singular focus, it reminded me of something I wrote a couple of years ago. I wrote it one year to the day after Kobe Bryant passed away. And the opening, the, the thesis of the column I wrote was the reason we gravitate towards people who are that competitive, like Kobe Bryant, like Michael Jordan, like Connor McDavid, like Sidney Crosby, is that we all feel that if we were that talented, if we had the physical ability to be the best player in the world, we would do everything in our power to make the most of that. We would not let our gift go to waste, that we are natural. We naturally gravitate towards the best at things because we understand how hard it is to be good at something. Whatever it is you do, you think about how hard it is to get good at that. If it's video editing, if it's graphic design, if it's copy editing, if it's accounting, if it's financial management, if it's teaching, if it's academic writing, 
whatever it is you do to be great in that field, it is years of your life you dedicate to forging to be the best at that. And that's why somebody like a McDavid is so eminently fascinating to me. Somebody who is clear cut the best player in the world and doesn't take it for granted and very clearly understands the responsibility that comes with that talent. That not only does he know he's the best player in the world, he also understands the responsibility and the burden that comes with that, not just as a player, but as a figurehead, as a representative of his country, as one of the faces of Canada. McDavid understands that no matter what happens with the team around him, it is always going to be his responsibility because he's the best player in the world. When you have that level of talent and you marry that to a type of determination that you're not going to let anything you are the buck stops with you. You know, I, I talk a lot. I talk a lot about some of the other captains in the NHL that are at a certain point. You can say all the rah rah locker room stuff you want. You can fight. You can block shots. All that stuff is great. At the end of the day, when everybody's looking up and down the bench, wondering who's going to make a play, who's going to find a way to be the difference maker, you want that type of captain. You want McDavid, who will look up and down the bench himself and say, oh, nobody else has it tonight. I will find a way. And that's something that I really I genuinely admire about McDavid and his game is that when the team loses, he puts it on himself and always says, I can be better. Even if it's not his fault, he is going to wear it. And that is something that we have made part of the burden of greatness, you know, when we expect you to be the best at all times, it can weigh on you. And for McDavid to have this singular focus, this singular approach, it has made him so, it has made him so unbelievably on another plane of existence from the rest of us in the hockey space that it's just, it's, it's hard to grapple with at times, but this is not just a story about Connor McDavid. Look up and down this lineup, all of the different players, all of the different coaches. Think about where Chris Knobloch was in August of last year. He was getting ready to coach an AHL team. Think about where Adam Henrique was in September, October, November of this season. Think about where Corey Perry was in September of this season. Look up and down that line. Think about where Matias Ekholm was a couple of years ago. Think about where Stuart Skinner was after the playoffs last year. Think about where Darnell Nurse was. Think about every single person on this team and their journey to get here. That is what I find the most interesting when we start talking about championship teams is how it all comes together, what the vision is, and why it works. It's not just that it works. We we watch the games. We know what we know how it happens. We see the goals. We see the saves. We see the block shots. We see all of that. The difference is when we start asking the why, that's where we get to a deeper, a more material understanding of what's going on within the game. And it's it's not something everybody cares about. I personally find the why and the how a lot more interesting than the game results. Obviously, you know, you want to watch the game, you want the drama, you want the excitement. But the counterpoint to that is. I find the human element within the game, how all of these guys came together to push this together, to get to this point. I find that stuff eminently fascinating as a sports person and frankly, just as a person, you know, the connection, the human element to this is not lost on me. And it's something that I find invaluable when we start talking about sports, because that's what makes sports the best. You know, I go back to the Spike Lee quote where apropos before Game 7 of Yankees-Red Sox in 2004, the ALCS, he's on the field, he's doing a hit with the 6 o'clock Sports Center, and Dan Patrick was the anchor. And Dan Patrick turns to him, and this is back when ESPN cared about baseball, and Dan Patrick was standing on the field, calls up the microphone, he goes, Spike, if you if you were going to write a movie, could you write a movie as dramatic as this series? And Spike Lee puts on this, like, what did you just say, smirk? And he's like, no, I couldn't. Movies, TV, that's all fake. This, sports, this is real. You can't make this up because this is real. We are going to take one quick break. 
be right back and we will talk about recent NHL history in Game 7s, so be sure to stick around on this edition of Locked on Oilers. I love sports. I love them so much, I never want them to stop. But as the hockey playoffs wind down, we get fewer games. And the sports, they're not sportsing like I want them to. But FanDuel lets me keep the sports going whenever I want. All I have to do is open the app and dream up bets anytime I'm in the mood. And this summer, FanDuel is hooking up all customers with a boost or bonus daily. That's right, there's something for everyone every day, all summer long. Me, I'm a big proponent. I love props. I'll go and look, throw two or three guys to hit a home run in baseball, or if you're so inclined, go throw together something over in the WNBA. The Liberty went to the game the other night, Thursday night, before game six on Friday. Had a great time. It, anytime you can go to live sports, you got to do it. And if you want to make the game a little bit more fun, you should check in with FanDuel. So head on over to FanDuel.com slash locked on and start making the most out of your summer. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of Major League Baseball. I want to thank everybody for tuning in to this Monday Game 7 edition of Locked On Oilers. Whether this is first thing in the morning, on your way to school, on your way to work, or if you're a masochist and you're working out first thing in the morning in the gym, I'm glad you chose Locked On Oilers to get set the tone for your Game 7. You know, I, I was thinking about going something along the lines of the Robert Duvall line in Apocalypse Now, the love the smell of napalm in the morning, smells like victory, you know. Game 7, Stanley Cup Final, best player in the world. It hasn't happened in a long time. You go back and look through the last handful of seasons. We haven't had a lot of these Game 7s. We're going to talk about the history in a minute, but we're tying this to the Edmonton slant of this. Uh, the best player in the world, Connor McDavid, is in a Game 7 for the Stanley Cup. The best trophy in all of sports, the most difficult postseason format of any any sport. Sure, if you want to argue the World Cup, I guess, but this, it does not get better than this. As a sports fan, it does not get better than this. This Oilers team, I don't know how you're not in love with this group. The lows have been brutal. To fire your coach the second week of November, insane. To rattle off a 670, 660 win percentage with the interim coach. Insanity. Stuff like this does not happen. You look through this playoff run. Sure, they handled LA. Nobody really was worried in their series about the Kings. That Canuck series, it was dicey. It was really dicey. We saw Cal Pickard in there at one point for two games. Cal Pickard, who had never been in an NHL playoff game before he came in relief for Skinner, we had never seen him in a playoff game. And that's who the Oilers got to turn their momentum around in the last round. Then they beat a deeper Stars team that had one of the five, ten best goalies in the world in Jake Ottinger, where Stuart Skinner outplayed Jake Ottinger in like five of the six games of that series. And now, to come back from three games to nothing and force a game seven, this is the stuff you will talk about for the rest of your life. So I'm going to click over to my notes. Obviously, I'm not in my usual setup where I have a second monitor to go back and forth. So you will forget, have to forgive me for my eyes darting back and forth between the camera to acknowledge the YouTube audience and my notes. But I'm going to click over to my notes here. So. Last game seven in last Stanley Cup final game seven, 2019 Blues at the Bruins. The Blues win that game 4 1. The Bruins home ice, and I talked about this with Gil on Locked On NHL on the national show for Monday. The Bruins got behind in that game. All of the energy was out of the crowd, and it was almost academic. I remember, I can vividly remember watching that game in my room at home and it was still on NBCSN. And I remember them, the broadcast showing a pan shot down the Bruins bench and every single guy had a thousand yard stare, not knowing 
where the goal was going to come from. And obviously, these are professional athletes. They're never going to say the game is over. Those looks, that told me what I needed to know. That told me the Blues were going to win that game. Prior to that, you have to go back to Boston, Vancouver. That is a series where the home team won the first two games. And the Bruins came storming back. They won games three and four on a 12-2 aggregate. Absolutely throttled Vancouver. And then winning on the road in Vancouver in 2011, winning 4 nothing. Prior to that, 2009, that was the last time the best player in the world was in a winner-take-all Stanley Cup Game 7. Sidney Crosby in the Red Wings. Sid gets his moment. They win the Stanley Cup. They, get, they win the game 2-1 to one in 2009. The Marion Hossa Bowl, as everybody remembers, after he had been on the Penguins the year before when they lost to Detroit, then he went to Detroit, and they lost to Pittsburgh. He ultimately, obviously, went on to win Stanley Cups in Chicago, but I digress. Prior to 2009, 2006, the last time the Oilers were there, they lost at Carolina 3-1 to in 2006. Prior to that, 2004, the Calgary Flames at the Tampa Bay Lightning. The Lightning win that game 2-1. to Disallowed goal. Very, very looming <laughs> disallowed goal conversation for anybody a little bit south in Calgary who might be hate watching this episode right now. And then before that, Anaheim at New Jersey, the Devils win that game three to nothing. That series, 2003, the last time a losing player won the Conn Smythe for playoff MVP. That, of course, Ducks goalie Jean Sebastian Jaguer. Connor McDavid, win or lose, I assume, is going to win the Conn Smythe. But like I said with Gil on Locked on NHL, Good luck getting him to accept the trophy if the Oilers lose this game. I, I cannot fathom the type of, the type of bittersweet juxtaposition it would be to be told you were the best player in the playoffs. Sorry though, you don't get to win the Stanley Cup. That's not fair. But one undercurrent and something I do think matters. I do think the fact the Oilers have juice the oilers have dictated how the last three games have gone and they've done that by getting out to leads we know and i've said this the entire playoffs going back to that series against the kings when the oilers play with a lead they play significantly better defense and stewart skinner looks a lot sharper they know if stewart skinner has to be the difference in a game where he's playing against sergey bobrovsky it's going to be a lot more of an uphill battle than say if he only has to be okay. And that's the goal here. For everybody that is not Stuart Skinner, you want those guys. So everybody else, the 18 out skaters, your 12 forward, six defensemen, you want all of those guys to find ways to lighten the load on each other. And I imagine we are going to see some gross time on ices. Won't be surprised if you see Bouchard and Ekholm up around 30 minutes. Won't be surprised if you see McDavid 28, 29 minutes as a forward. Ditto Dreisaitl. I imagine we will see quite a bit of Dreisaitl and McDavid together in this game because of the circumstances. And we're going to get to the circumstances. We're going to do our Game 7 pep talk in a minute. But recent NHL history tells you the road team scoring first, suck all the air out of the building, and then you start to build the groundswell. You start to tick, 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 tick. And that's what happened in game five. You think about how game five ended with Kachuk swooping that puck out of the net and then McDavid recovering the loose puck and Oliver Ekman Larson not playing any defense. And that ultimately was the difference. Yes, Florida had gotten back into that game and definitely made it hairy for Edmonton down the stretch, but Edmonton got out to a lead. They had margin for error. They made some mistakes, but not enough mistakes that it killed them. We are going to take one more quick break. Be right back. We're going to set the table. We're going to do a pep talk, and we're going to mentally psych ourselves up for game number seven. So be sure to stick around. Passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. Superchargers, roof racks, exhaust kits, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your number one ride or die, 
you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay Guaranteed Fit, your part is guaranteed to fit your ride every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. With all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only. Exclusions do apply. eBay Guaranteed Fit is only available for U.S. customers. Thank everybody. Hanging in. All right, friends. Game seven, Stanley Cup final. I can be honest. I've never been here. I have never been here. I have not been in game seven of a Stanley Cup final with rooting interest. This is the first time in my life I'm experiencing something like this. I've been, I can't even say I've had this with baseball. I've never had this with basketball. My, the Knicks, the Mets, they're not getting to game sevens of anything. The last time the Mets were in Game 7 of a World Series, they did go on to win the World Series, so you got that. But this is what it's all about. We, I, I talked a lot in the first segment about this idea of the burden of greatness, of expectation, of why we find great players compelling and why we care so much. The thing that's great about sports, and I'm going to echo the sentiments of Spike Lee that I quoted earlier. No one knows. They have to go out there and do it. It's why we play the games. Don't get me wrong. I love data analysis. I do plenty of data analysis trying to get a deeper understanding of players, of teams, of series, of games. We have to play the games. One game, the best trophy in all of sports, the best player in the world, and like the fourth or third, depending how you feel about Leon Dreisaitl in relation to, say, Austin Matthews or Nathan McKinnon. This is what it is all about as a fan. You have spent the last nine months on this team believing. You might have waned at times when they fired Jay Woodcroft and brought in somebody in Chris Knobloch with no NHL experience. You might have wavered when Cal Pickard got in there. You might have wavered. You might have wavered at three nothing down, and I was ready to call them dead. I said the only way this was going to turn around was if something special happened, and the Oilers are on the doorstep of being one of the most famous teams ever. And let me clarify that: when we talk about the annals of sports history, when we're going through the pantheon of great teams. The story that goes along with it is what matters. We talk about the 96 Bulls winning 72 games in the regular season. The 73 and 9 Golden State team with the team the year before Durant got there. We talk about the 2004 Red Sox breaking the curse. We talk about the 2016 Cubs breaking the curse. The Showtime Lakers, the Bird Parish Celtics. We talk about the Gretzky Messier Oilers. We talk about the Messier Rangers. We talk about the Crosby, Malkin, Latang Penguins. Not only are those great players on great teams, we talk about the stories of putting those teams together. You look through recent NHL history and some of the names we're talking about here. I know not everybody likes Jack Eichel. I know not everybody likes Alex Petrangelo. Those guys are on the cup forever. We go down the list. We go to Colorado, McKinnon, Rantanen. Landeskog. Gabe Landeskog probably gave up his professional hockey career. I know he is attempting to mount a comeback, but that's how much it means. I think about I think about Chara, Game 7, 2019, with the fishbowl, playing with a broken jaw, with his mouth wired shut. I think about a lot of these stories a lot of the time. And I've said this a lot in the last three days, I've said this a lot this entire play. I've said this since the Dallas series that teams don't get this far that often. You have to appreciate it. You have to savor it. We talked about how it's been 10 months, you know, physical testing before preseason, middle of September, like the 10th, the 11th is when testing starts. And then you get two weeks of preseason. This journey started 10 months ago. It is July next week. You have put those 10 months in addition to your entire life to this point to get here, one hockey game, 
I'm going to click over to my notes here, so excuse me for the delay in the stream of thought, but I want to get the number right. The Edmonton Oilers have won 64 games, including playoffs and regular season this year. Their wins against Dallas, Vancouver, and LA, the series against Florida, and then the 49 regular season wins they've had. It's all, it's all led to this. And this is what makes sports great. We are all going to sit around our TVs at 8 o'clock. The puck's going to get dropped about 8.15 because of American TV. I'm sorry. I apologize in advance. They are going to play game seven with the cup in the building with the possibility of finishing a lot of sentences. Who's the only team in the modern era to come back from three, nothing down and win the Stanley cup finals, the Edmonton Oilers. Who did the Oilers beat the first time Connor McDavid went to the Florida Panthers? They are one win away from answering a lot of questions. And I started this season, funny enough, I, I did the hit on the NHL, the Locked On NHL previews. I did the one for the Oilers, and I said the, oil, the key to the Oilers season would be finding one more secondary scorer to complement their elite players. I mentioned Dylan Holloway as the guy to keep an eye on because he was young. He had some high-level traits. He had some high-quality traits that would lead you to believe he was capable of statistical production at the NHL level. And he's had some moments in this playoffs. Pretty much everybody on this Oilers team has had a moment in these playoffs. And that's one of the keys to stringing together this type of magic. It can't just be McDavid and Dreisaitl. Tonight, maybe you can get away with just those two being special. But an entire regular season three playoff series and six games of a cup final, you're going to need a little something from everyone. It's not just the stars. It is everyone. We talk about this series through six games. It has been a case of Edmonton stars playing great. Edmonton's depth rising to the occasion. You look at getting goals from Henrik and Fogel and Nuge. Oh, yes, I'm throwing Nuge in the depth column. I'm sorry. You throw in goals from Matias and Mark. You throw in goals from Bush. It takes everyone. I am going to spend my entire Monday thinking about this game. I am going to lament a missed opportunity if it does not happen. That will be a very upsetting episode of Lockdown Oilers at about 1130, 12 o'clock at night, and I'm not looking forward to that. So I'm going to say it very straightforward and plain old English. I think the Oilers are going to win this game. Every fiber of your being should tell you the Oilers can win this game. I'm not ready to say the Oilers should win this game because they have to go out and play the games. To As our friend Spike Lee says, that's what makes sports great. You can't make it up. And this is real. It's going to happen in real time. And we're going to watch a lot of questions about a lot of players, a lot of decision makers, and the league at large be answered. and. No matter what, this has been an incredible ride, and this is why you love sports. It's for opportunities like this to really put together something special. So with all of that said, that will just about do it for this edition of Locked on Wheelers. If you could be so kind, please throw the show a subscription wherever you listen to your podcast. If you're on Apple or Spotify, I beg you, please leave the show a five-star review means the world, helps the show out a lot, helps other people find the show, join the conversation. If you're watching over on YouTube, hit the subscribe button, hit the alarm bell so you get a notification whenever new content goes live. Leave me a comment. The Oilers win and why. Tell me why. I will talk to you guys after game seven. Let's go Oilers.